really excited about this morning's talk because um, it's a passage of scripture that describes to us the church. The church is what we are a part of, whether we like it or not. Some people might feel that they don't have to be going to church to be part of church. Well, God's plan is that we would always be able to come together to experience what it is that God has for us, either by giving and gifting to what God has done in us for others or by receiving. And so this morning, as we talk about the church, we're talking about the, the flow-on effect of what we just experienced this morning when we took communion. You see, the church in all its forms around the world gathers around what is called the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, uh, whatever, call, whatever you call it, communion is the starting place for the church as people identify with the fact that God has given His only Son, that He would die for our sins, be raised to new life, and then He has given and gifted to us His Spirit, which causes the church to be what it is. Now this morning, um, I'm titling my message, One Body, One Purpose. And during my thinking, it's amazing how your mind goes in different places when you're preparing a, a message, but I was thinking about how it is that over the years, different families historically have had a different purpose. And I got thinking about the clans in Scotland or Ireland, uh, how it is that these different clans had their own coat of arms, their own tartan, and their own logos, their own branding. Before Saatchi and Saatchi, families used to brand themselves, okay? And they'd wear their brand on their spotten. And, uh, and go off to battle and fight the neighbors. That was the way it went. went. Now, the Mackenzies have this s- slow... Any Mackenzies in the house related to a Mackenzie? Here we go, back there. Now, the Mackenzies have a slogan which says, or a logo which says, I shine, not burn. I shine, not burn. Okay, I thought it was quite intriguing. I mean, it takes a bit of unpacking. I hope they weren't talking about literally burning, but they shine. Okay, and out of Ireland, the, uh, the Ryan family have on their, their, lotto, their, their logo or their motto, I would rather die than be disgraced. I would rather die than be disgraced. Imagine sitting around the table with the Ryan family, you know, generation after generation. How you doing there, son? Remember the family lotto? Lotto. Motto. <laughs> Remember... <laughs> Remember the family lotto ticket, it's your turn to buy it, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, the family motto, hey, what is it? Better to die than be disgraced, hey? Man, that would really stir you up, wouldn't it, if you had a family logo like that. Um, the Doyle family, plenty of Doyles in Ireland, and uh, their family crest says, he conquers by fortitude, he conquers by fortitude. And another word for fortitude is good old-fashioned guts, eh? good old-fashioned courage. Eh? And so, so you've got these family crests which tell a family what they should be aspiring to be. And uh, like I say, you just imagine them sitting around a, a table with a fire roaring and plenty of good food on the table. And old granddad's there, you know, oh, in my day we did this and, you know, by courage we did it. Eh? It makes for good viewing on TV, wouldn't it, eh? Yeah? You like that sort of thing? Rom-coms. I know what you like. Rom-coms. It's not a rom-com. But one body, one purpose. And as a body, we are called to one purpose, and that is to glorify God through Jesus Christ and to make Him known. Jesus' final words are our first command. Jesus' final words were, go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you see, this great commission for us, is a powerful pulling together of everything that we are to do as the body of Christ. And each one of us has been given that crest or that motto to wear as we move forward in this life. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to pick up on where Rob left off last week as he was introducing us to the body and the gifts in the body. Bless you. And, uh, and we're going to look at this through the message translation because I think the message translation just stretches it out a little bit, and it gives us a little bit more insight into the words that Paul is saying. So let's go. Paul said, God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere. But God himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. That's a nice way of putting it, isn't it? 
The variety is wonderful. And then he, we've got a list here of these gifts. And as Peterson writes it, he writes it in this way. He says, wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out one by one by the one Spirit of God. He decides who gets what and when. He decides who gets what and when. So these gifts that Rob touched on last week and that we're looking at here in front of us, um, these are the gifts that God has given to each one of us. And these aren't necessarily natural gifts. They are spiritual gifts, even though natural gifts and spiritual gifts can work together. So a natural gift might give you the ability to run a fast 400 meters, okay? A spiritual gift is completely different again, but not, not unusual for God to use gifts to work together. The first thing I want to say about spiritual gifts is this, is that we shouldn't be limiting God to the size of our own experience. You see, whatever happens to our, in and through our lives, we determine, sorry, we measure those experiences between being those who are good and those who are bad, and those that are in the middle somewhere. And what happens is if we have a good experience, particularly in respect to our Christian faith, we more often than not want others to experience what it is that was good for you. And therefore, we can very easily say that this is the best gift and the only gift, and therefore this is the only way we should do something. So there's a saying that says, if you only own a hammer, everything is a nail. If you only own a hammer, everything is a nail. So if you have the gift of um, prayer, you will say to somebody, hey, listen, I know that prayer works on every occasion. If somebody has the gift of, um, of, of hospitality, they will say the best thing to do is to love somebody and care for them. You know, if somebody has the gift of teaching, they will say, you know what the answer to this is? You've got to get in the word more, Okay. And somebody might have the gift of evangelism. You say, look, all things become clear when you're sharing your faith. Now, all of those things are true, but your experience is only one of literally hundreds of different experiences that we will be sharing in the body of Christ when it comes to what it is that God has done in us and through us and for us. So therefore, what Paul is saying is we need each other to be able to express the fullness of whom God is. We need each other to know who Christ is. Because through Christ, sorry, through others, we see Jesus in a different way. Is that fair to say? I know I just get blown away when I'm sitting with people and they're telling their story about how God has moved in different ways in their lives. And I'm just like, wow, God does that? More recently, I had a um, commentary given to me, a Bible study book commentary by John Douglas, who's one of our senior uh, citizens around here, great guy, Dr. John. And this book was written, it's a compilation of uh, scholarship by five authors who come from Africa. And so they are looking at scriptures through African eyes. And it's remarkable, the stories that they can share about Jesus working in and through scripture in a village context in Africa. Very, very different. And so all of these different experiences help us be enriched in understanding of who Christ is. So let's have a look at this, what Paul says about this body. He says this, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Now, Obviously, this passage is about, is about the body. Okay, that's what we read there. We see it's about body. But on the third line of this passage up here, you can see it says, we were baptized by one spirit. And then the final part of this passage says, and we were all given one spirit to drink. What Paul is describing is that our body, the body of Christ, and us individually have been blessed with the power of the spirit to do what it is that we're called to do. And the Holy Spirit is a gift to us, the person of Christ, the gift to us, who will fill us repetitively if we seek him to be able to do the will that he wants for us to do. You see, we can't be Christians in our own strength. 
We can't change the world around us in our own strength. We can't be a blessing to others in our own strength. But if we drink from the Spirit, if we seek the Lord in respect to uh, pursuing Him in a devotional way every day, if we chase down what it is God wants for us, the Holy Spirit will be powerful and active in and through us. And that's the greatest desire we have. You know, when I talk to older folks and they explain to me about how their life has been lived in Christ, they will testify again and again to how it is that God broke through the natural and into the supernatural where God did the exceedingly abundantly above when it is that they didn't expect to see God do anything in this this fashion. And so wherever you are and whatever stage of life you're in, you need to be seeking God and seeking the power of His Spirit to lead you, to guide you, to strengthen you, to purpose you so that you can actually be all that God wants you to be. I see, uh, you know, I think about the the folks over here, young folks, this this church over here, You know, the most exciting thing you can do for one another is pray for each other that you would discover the gifts of God that God has given you, that you would affirm in one another what you see, and it might be just developing. You know, it might be something that you can see in one another, and you're you're confident enough to affirm in other people what it is that you see in them. And it's amazing the difference those words of encouragement can, can bring. Isn't that true? We've all been there, eh? You know, you just see people, you say to them, hey, listen, you know, when you spoke to me the other day, that was really insightful. You know, you might have a gift of wisdom. You know, have you thought about that? You know, or when you see somebody who's a pioneer, that's like a gift of apostleship, the ability to be able to break new ground and make make a difference for others. That's all what it is that we're talking about here, all these different gifts. And so we have this thing called the body, called the church, and we're all part of it, and we're all part of what it looks like, and we shape its future by defining its present. Now, a few years ago, um, most of you appreciate that I've I've done some of these big walks across Spain, and uh, back in 2018, myself and Peter Foster, uh, pastor from Focatani Baptist, we rolled into Santiago, which was our destination after the the 800-kilometer walk, and um, and we, we turned up this weekend, it was a long weekend, and it happened to be Pentecost weekend. Now, Catholics have this great tradition of taking time to celebrate all these religious festivals, even if they're not very religious. So um, we walked around the city, four-day festival, perfect time to be there. Pete and I just really relaxed. Uh, there was heaps of free food and entertainment, which is always good. Um, but I've got some, some uh, video here of what was going on in the city at the time as these people celebrated Pentecost. So here we have a uh, couple of young guys there. It looks like he's playing a pizza carton, but it's actually more than that. Uh, It's actually an instrument. And so these guys are on the street celebrating. Go around the corner to another square and you find these um, people in traditional dance just celebrating again Pentecost, celebrating the festival of Pentecost go around another street to another square and you find these folks here uh, celebrating with drums, okay? And they would pull people from the audience and teach you how to play drums in time. So that was a lot of fun. And then around another part of the town, there was a symphony playing. Just so cool, eh? You know, just so cool culture. When it runs that deep for thousands of years, they can do things really, really well. But all that to say that these musicians we're all different, but they're all celebrating the same thing by bringing their different gifts together to be able to be a city that celebrated Pentecost. Wonderful time, wonderful occasion. So let's have a look at what it is that Paul is saying to the body here when he talks about all of these different gifts. Last week, Rob mentioned this Greek word called sim- symphero. Thanks, Rob. Symphero. That's what tweaked my mind about a symphony. Symphero means beneficial. So when you see the gifts of the Spirit working in this way that are beneficial to everybody, you've got people preferring one another in a band environment, which is what Rob explained to us last week. So let's have a look at what this looks like as Paul describes it. Paul says, now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, 
because I am not an I, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Now, you don't get more simple than this illustration, do you, really? Because the thing is that we, we're not without excuse, because everybody has a body and everybody understands what an ear is and what an eye is. And so Paul is saying, look, your hand might get into rebellion, okay? Your hand might decide that it doesn't want to become part of this body anymore. This hand might decide it is too cool to be connected to this body, okay? And so it tries to disappear. Well, it can't, and it doesn't matter what sort of attitude this hand has, it still belongs to the body, all right? And the same with your ears and your eyes, Paul is saying. And the thing about the body of Christ is that it is integrated together and it's designed to work together. And so it doesn't matter whether parts of your, the body are in rebellion, they still belong. And we live in a world where there's so much of this idea that it's me, myself, and I, and the rights that I have to be able to express myself in a way that is different to everybody else. And that can easily permeate the church. But the church is a place where we embrace one another and we remind people that you are part of the body and what you bring is valuable. There's no escaping that. You can argue all about it all you want. You can, you can get frustrated about it, but you are part of the body as a believer in Jesus. And if we're not looking after this body in such a way that it actually nurtures and propagates itself by virtue of encouraging one another, then we'll find that the body fractures and it just sort of becomes unhealthy. So if you can imagine if, um, like my body here, if my leg decided that it didn't want to participate anymore, you know, um, you'd call me hoppy, wouldn't you? Eh? Now, there's plenty of hoppy churches around, okay? And there's lots of reasons why the legs might stop working. You know, one of the big reasons is um, it's like, oh, why'd you stop working, Mr. Leg? Uh, well, I got bruised and hurt a while back, you know, so now I've gone into recess. I just don't do anything now, okay? And, and the thing about church life, the thing about church life is that <clears throat> you are going to experience all people from all backgrounds. Everybody's going to have a difference, opinion, difference of opinion about different things. But <clears throat> our view, our view of the, of, of the church needs to be big enough to embrace all of that difference, that's the challenge for us, all of the difference, so that when we look at the church worldwide, we see this difference and we celebrate it. You know, some people celebrate with music in ways that we never would even imagine. It's amazing. Some people celebrate the body of Christ with acts of service, some with greater levels of proclamation, but we are the body. And the important thing that Paul is saying to us is here, it says, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, we would the body be. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. And I call this a beautiful complexity. A beautiful complexity. You just think of your own physical body. Okay, here's a diagram of um, some of the major arteries and veins in your body. As you sit there right now, Okay, we hope that your heart is beating. Okay, your heart is beating and it's putting blood through your veins. Right now, there is this miraculous complexity that is happening right inside your own body. And when we magnify that and amplify that into this illustration of the body of Christ, we realize that the miracle of the church is all about this complexity working together as the Spirit leads. And Paul is wanting to affirm that every part of the body is valuable. Every part of the body is valuable. Now, to try to illustrate this point, um, I went looking for a description of an attitude. An attitude is often hard to describe, but here's an illustration that describes an attitude that each one of us should bring to the church when in respect to the body of Christ and the gifts. Here's, a couple of, here's some pictures of a couple of old guys from the 1870s. Now, these two guys slugged it out for the 1874 election for the Prime Minister of the UK. Okay? Now, you'll be very surprised to know that the guy on the left here 
is William Gladstone. He doesn't look glad at all, does he? He looks like a grumpy old guy. And the other guy is Benjamin Disraeli. Right? So they were in a very tight race to who, see who would lead the UK. And in fact, over a period of about 16 to 20 years, these two guys exchanged the office of Prime Minister consistently. They were, they were such fierce competitors and the nation was split over whether one would lead better than the other. However, there was a lady who wrote about both of these men. Her name was Jenny Jerome. And this is what she had to say about them. She said, when I left the dining room after sitting next to Gladstone, I thought he was the cleverest man in England. But when I sat next to Disraeli, I left feeling I was the cleverest woman. <laughs> now, that describes an attitude, doesn't it? That describes an attitude. And the thing about the body of Christ is that the gift that you have been given is something you need to be proud of, something you need to own, something you need to enhance, something you need to grow within you for the sake of getting an overinflated ego. No, for the sake of the body of Christ. Now, we go back to this guy, William Gladstone. Now, apparently he was a good politician, but when he would go on the campaign trail, he would speak to his audience for up to five to six hours at a time. His speeches would go over five hours at a time. Now, there's somebody who has a lot to say, obviously quite, quite confident, yeah? And the thing about it is that this distinction between somebody who's in it for themselves and somebody who's in it for others is really what I'm trying to draw out of this illustration, as you can see. You see, the beautiful thing about the body of Christ is that regardless of the gifts that you have been given, I know for myself, I'm super impressed with the gifts that I don't have when I see them being outworked in other people. Do you have that? I, I just love it when I see people who are doing things that I can't do, who, who have, a, have a mind for technical things, for example. You know, um, these guys at the back here, who, who without, we wouldn't be able to run our church services or any services for that matter. Um, I honestly know how to turn the lights on so that I don't stumble in the dark. Just these main ones, I have no, I can't even turn on a microphone. I've got no idea. And I could go and learn, and then a little bit of knowledge would be a dangerous thing. I'd just be a pain. I really would. Because I think I'd know more than I do know, and therefore I'd frustrate those who do know, and I don't know, and they wouldn't tell me that I don't know because I'm the senior pastor, and they've got to pretend that I do know so that my ego doesn't get affected. That's how it works, eh? It's sort of weird, isn't it, really? But there's a whole lot of amazing people in this place who have amazing gifts and talents. And I just love it when I see people expressing the gifts that God has given them. Now, let me tell you a little backstory about this lady, Jenny Jerome. Some of you may know this, but she's the mother of Winston Churchill. And I just think it's intriguing that she would have the insight to be able to value character over information. Yeah, character, because that's essentially what she did, didn't she? She determined that Disraeli had a greater character by virtue of the way that he treated her. Amazing, isn't it? You see, Paul said to the Philippian church that we should do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And that's a fantastic thing to do, except, except when the pressure comes on. Now, I've got this photograph here of a piece of steel being bent into a particular shape. The thing about the body of Christ, it is going, that it, what it will do is that it will take your will of steel, we've all got a will of steel, and it will shape you. The body of Christ will shape you. And often, through the heat and the fire and the intensity of the experiences that you have with other people, in the body of Christ. I can remember being a Christian for a couple of years and Michaela and I were leading a small group in our home. And it was an experience that was new to us. In fact, we, we probably got dropped in way too early. But that was okay. We just prayed a whole lot more. But there was this one guy and um, he was one of these guys who just sort of wanted his voice to be heard all the time. And we didn't, I didn't know what to do with this guy, you know? 
Because we got to the stage where people were ringing us up saying, you know, if, if that guy turns up this week, I'm not coming again. You know, why? Oh, because he's a know-it-all and a blowhard. You know, and I'm like, oh, but he's, he's a brother in the Lord, you know, and here I am leading this group. Like, oh, what do I do? And I was so concerned about this. You know, how do you find that balance between loving somebody and correcting somebody? And I'd only been a Christian for a little while, and this guy had been to Bible college, so he sort of knew everything, and, and I just felt like a moron. I didn't know what to do. I was getting up early in the morning and praying, and um, praying for him and praying for me. And I was just, was, I was so obsessed and preoccupied with this whole situation because the whole life group was going to go down the gurgler, you know, on the basis of this one guy's ego that needed satisfying. And um, I've just seen someone here who knows what I'm talking about. Um, it's a true story. It's a true story. 30 years ago, eh, bro? Anyway. I prayed, and God did some miraculous things. The quietest, most humble person in that small group one day just stood up, not stood up in a physical sense, but just eyeballed this guy and just went, and he was like a normal person after that. That person just right-sized him in the kindest and most humble way. And it's always amazing when you see somebody else do your dirty work for you, isn't it? You know, because I learned a lesson in how to be gracious. For me, you know, with the level of giftedness that I have in my previous life experience, I just wanted to take him out the back. And um, anyway, I won't describe what, what the thoughts were. But the body of Christ will bend your will, your strong, fierce, and determined will, if you allow yourself to be subject to the heat. Okay, if you allow yourself to be subject to the heat and the body of Christ does that and it should be doing that in a way that's loving and kind. Yeah. So let's press on. Paul says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat them with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, are treated with special modesty. Now, we're talking here about parts that are less honorable and unpresentable. Paul's talking here about nakedness, okay? We wear clothes. It's sort of been that way since the beginning of time. And what Paul is saying is that part of our, the, body, the body of Christ, there are also dynamics within the body of Christ where people are unpresentable. Now, what he means by that is there are people with Social problems, social conditions, physical problems, physical conditions. People with mental uh, illness or, or just simply are out of order. You know, one of the most fantastic things that I ever experienced in the body of Christ, and it's something that's familiar to me now, though, is just the diversity. The diversity of people that you find in the church. You go to a different um, club and you'll find people who are all relatively similar Uh, relatively similar backgrounds, relatively similar aspirations. The body of Christ is so unique, so unique. And as much as there is such a diversity, and God calls us to be a community that loves and cares for one another, and we get to see Jesus through the eyes of other people and get to see their view of the world in ways that we would never experience ourselves. You know, somebody who's suffered from uh, a mental illness they will see Jesus in a completely different way to what I will do. Does that make sense to you? Okay, but they need protection. They need shelter. They need care. They need love. They need a sense in which Paul says, a special modesty whereby we embrace them and we cover their weaknesses. We cover, uh, in some cases, their fallenness. And we take them on a journey with us. Just think of the backstory of what Paul is writing to the Corinthians about here. Paul has talked about a group who were uh, affirming incest that was going on in the church. Paul was talking about a group there who were, who were celebrating on their own communion and getting, turning it into a drunken party. Paul is saying that all of these people are the part of the body of Christ and they're all growing up, they're all being shaped into something that looks more like Jesus. 
But some of us start from way back. Some of us start from way back. And so therefore that process of learning together, being together, giving grace to one another, is such a, it's such a vital part of being the church. And your personal growth will come from giving grace to these people who are different to you. Does that make sense? We give grace to those who are different. And we, in turn, learn that grace for ourselves. So Paul goes on. He, he, he's not finished with this part of the, his, um, <clears throat> his, his, um, his impressions about this. He says, While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices. We are fused together. It's as if we have, what Paul is saying, it's as if we're all connected with one big nervous system. Yeah? You think of that. If we are all connected here, you know, if, if, if I want to get this really strange, do something really strange here, I'd say we could all hold hands and then just pretend that in that holding of hands, it's like we had a, a shared nervous system so that if I pinch somebody over here, we'd all feel it. Yeah? A friend of mine, uh, David Graham, um, who was pastoring for some years, spent a bit of time up in Papua New Guinea and uh, started a Bible school in a village up there. And um, <clears throat> I went up there and taught at the Bible school. This is back uh, many years ago now. And uh, I met the people, and the people were just absolutely beautiful. Like the, uh, the softness of these folks who lived in the hill country outside of Mount Hagen was just mind-blowing for me. Uh, we would go and travel to the villages where we were asked to share the gospel there. And... Um, we'd be walking along and the men my age or older would just walk up beside me and grab my hand and we'd walk down the path together holding hands, you know? And I was like, oh, this is unusual. This is, I can handle this. I can handle this. I can remember we played a game of uh, touch rugby one time and um, we sat down at half time and the men came along, two men came along and just leaned against me and held my hands. One of them held one hand, one of them held the other. And uh, we were just sitting there talking, you know, this is, this, this takes um, team, team mission, this takes mateship to a whole new level, you know. But um, I didn't get to experience this, but David told the story and it just blew my mind. He said that he was on a, a public motor vehicle, essentially a bus, and, um, <clears throat> and they, there was a whole group of people there on the bus. They stopped and they picked up this mum and her son. The son was 12 years old and he was leaving their village to go to schooling in another town which is three or four hours away. And so the mum gets on the bus with the son and she's crying. Because why? Because she's going to not see her son for months. David said within five minutes everyone on the bus was crying. He said he'd never experienced anything like it before. He said the whole, these people knew each other and, and, and experienced each other's grief and loss so that when they saw that mum crying over her son, they cried too. Remarkable, isn't it? And I think it's a beautiful illustration of what Paul is saying here is that when one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. When one part is honoured, the whole part of the body is honoured. You know, we get a kick out of seeing Christians do well, don't we? You know, wherever they might be, in their workplace, on the sports field. You know, to see um, Caleb Clark last night, I watched the rugby last night, I won't tell you the result, but to see Caleb Clark, who's a new, new All Black and Christian guy, on his knees literally praying at the end of the game. And the camera zoomed in on him, and you would sort of see the cameraman going, oh, what do I do with this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, Beautiful thing, eh? And you just go, he's our guy. You know, he's our guy. And we, we are honored by that. We're blessed by that. And whenever I hear stories of you in the community or in your workplace or serving amongst the children or the elderly, you know, my heart just explodes. I'm like, this is what it's all about. 
This is the most beautiful thing in the world to be a part of. And we all, with our seemingly little gifts that we have, we always feel that we never got enough. We can make a huge difference. You know, and sometimes you think, oh, you know, I, I just got to go and see that person. And you, you could make them a cake or something like that. And, you know, you can go over and you give them a cake and you say, hey, I just felt that I should give you the cake. And they go, oh, thanks very much. And, and in that moment, in that moment, there'll be a transaction. And you'll walk away and you'll go, it wasn't about the cake. It was about the fact that God gave me something to encourage them in that moment. So, you know, the cake is the excuse. The words of God might be prophetic in that moment for somebody. It's amazing, isn't it, how God works like that? And that's the beautiful thing about encouraging one another, strengthening one another, looking at the brother and sister and saying, you know what? You could be absolutely amazing if you just pursue this goal, chase down this, this sense of burden that you have for, for lost people or for people who are suffering from social injustice, whatever it might be. You can chase that down. It's a beautiful thing. Now you are part of the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. In a very simple way, the gifts that we've been given allow us to draw from one another and also to give to one another. A little bit of give and take. How many of you find it easier to give than receive? How many of you find it easier to give than receive? How many of you struggled when there was a season in your life and you were the recipient? Yeah? Yeah? I know I've been in that scenario before. I'd, I, had, I had to have something done at hospital and their house was being moved and some mates turned up and mowed my lawns, you know, and I'm like, oh, oh. You know, I feel, feel a bit stink about that. And yet that's what I was learning, was that I also have to receive as much as it's easier to give. And so Paul finally finishes with this this. Uh, celebration, if you like, of these gifts. He says, now, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Now, we could, we could, and maybe in another season, spend more time unpacking all these spiritual gifts. But essentially, what Paul is describing here is a spearhead of mission, a spearhead of mission, so this is the season when the apostles were literally breaking new ground of mission all through Asia Minor. You know, as far as Spain uh, and, and many places, we're not sure where, how far they went because um, sometimes there's a little bit of myth and legend thrown in there as well. But the beauty of what Paul is describing here is a way in which the, the church has pioneered and made ground and uh, shared the love of Jesus throughout the world. But then finally he says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. So regardless of where you're at, Paul is saying, press in. And when you desire the greater gifts, what he's saying is be the best that you can. Be the best that you can. Don't hold back. Don't have somebody speaking in your head, you know, I oh, know you shouldn't be bigger than you are because that will mean you're a fat head. You know, we, and New Zealand is a classic for this, eh? You know? you know, we don't have to worry about people getting too elevated because we pull them down real quickly. But Paul says the opposite. He says, desire the greater gifts. In other words, be the best that you can. And if it's uh, an apostle, if it's a teacher, an apostle, a pastor, all these things, that's great. But wherever you're at, take the spiritual gifts that you've been given and fan them into flame, enhance them, work on them, develop them, study about them, pray about them, get people to, to talk to you about their experiences of what it might have been that they have experienced in this whole area of giftedness and ensure that there is nothing that separates you from fulfilling what it is that God wants for you. And we, all of us, will be your cheerleaders. You know, one of the things that I, I'm really excited about this morning is seeing um, the Louis family over, over here on, in the band, you know. There's three members of the, of the family playing the band here and, uh, and seeing young Noah. You guys can come out now if you want. You know, I'm talking about you. 
young Noah over here playing the drums. He's a fantastic drummer, you know. And we get to see um, all of these folks, you know, even old guys like Don here. Uh, you know? And, and, and it's, it's a symphony, isn't it? Symphero, playing for the benefit of one another, for the benefit of God, for the benefit of our worship. It's just a beautiful thing. And so we are part of something that's far greater than us, beyond our imagination, but we get to experience it and we get to live it and we get to celebrate it. And so with this final song today, why don't you just lift your voices as a way of giving back to God, just an understanding of your own, of of how cool it is and how important it is to be part of the body of Christ. Yeah? Because we've got people, the body of Christ has got um, people all over the place celebrating, being who we are in Christ, running businesses, getting excited about all sorts of things. So, hey, um, Mana, stand up, mate. Just stand up for a sec. So Mana, you often see him on stage here, but is it next week you start? Or this week? Oh, you mean they're two weeks? Mana's down in Wellington learning to be a policeman. Okay, he's gone police training college. So up until then, Mana was involved here on our music team and helping out with small groups with, um, son, um, with youth and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, where's God taking him? We don't know, but he might be the commissioner of police one day. And why not? God bless you, Mana. Is it going well? Hey, done lots of running? Yeah, that's good. You got to be able to run fast, chase down those bad guys. <laughs> God bless you. Yeah. Anyway, I could sit up here all day and brag on you fellows. I really could. You're awesome, eh? I'm just so blessed. I am. I'm blessed. Anyway, I'm going to pray in a minute. If I pray now, I'll cry. So let's sing a song and I'll come back. If you feel comfortable here, why don't you stand to your feet and join with us as we sing this last song. And like Craig said, I mean, can I encourage you to lift your voice, to lift your hands? And let God do the rest.
today to talk about God's kindness leading us towards repentance. Um, I'll just tell you a little story as we finish. Um, after the first service this morning, um, Dave Jackson, some of you know Dave, came over to me and he goes, Craig, you know, I just celebrate the fact that we've got such good things going on in church and technology, he said. He said, last week, he said, last Sunday, I was actually fishing for whitebait at the Kaituna River. Now, in my boat, he said, and uh, I watch the service online. I put my camera, my, my phone at the back of the front of the boat there. And he said, and when Pastor Rob was preaching, he said, a big shoal of white bait came in. So I had to stop the service for a little while. And he said, I've got a couple of pounds of white bait as Pastor Rob was preaching. You know, he says, isn't it wonderful, the body of Christ has got this dynamic where we can, and, and I was like, I'm not. But then he said, there's a pound of white bait for you, Craig, in the freezer. I said, oh, praise God, you know. <laughs> praise God. You know. So anyway, I don't really know what to think about that, to be quite honest. But anyway, say, Rob, you know, a bit like Jesus, you know, he talked to the disciples about throwing the net on the other side, you know, and the fish all came in. It was all happening during your sermon, bro. Man, say no more. Say no more. Let me pray, eh? Father, we thank you for the body of Christ. 
it's such a an amazing amazing experience to be part of it and uh and, and it's very easy to for us to just sort of take it for granted and yet here we've had this experience in the last few months of not being able to meet and all of a sudden oh we get hungry for fellowship and we realize what we're missing and, and we realize that not only can we receive but we can give it's a beautiful thing so god i just want to pray that throughout this uh this week and these days ahead we can be reminded of what it is that we each bring and that we can sharpen and hone the gift that we've been given because we desire the, the greater gifts we desire the greater results we desire the greater things so that we might be a blessing in your name to others so lord we thank you for each other and we ask you bless us this week in jesus name why don't you turn to the person next to you and just say hey i'm glad you're part of the body of christ and i know you've been put here to bless me what do you reckon <laughs>